And it is Saturday, and we're going to be talking about money. We're going to be talking about the stock market as we come through this time of Ukraine and Russia during that war, after that war. We're going to be talking about the impact on the markets. There's some significant impact, and that's going to affect the stocks or certain stocks. It's going to give some stocks added impetus. It's going to give a drag on others. We're going to come to that later in the program. But I want to begin with an article that just came out about Cambridge Investment Research. Now, Cambridge Investment Research has over $100 billion in management. They have 3,600 advisors. Their profits for 2020 were $1.1 billion. Understand where we are in this industry, in this financial services industry, since 2014, revenues have been growing. Actually, if we go back, it's probably since 2010. But from that period of time, revenues have been growing, assets have been growing, but costs have been growing faster than revenues. So what do you do? What do you do? You can do something to further increase your revenues so that you offset the increasing cost, or you can cut back on cost, or you can do what Cambridge Investments did. Since 2004, advisors have failed to disclose material conflicts of interest. They failed to disclose those. And Cambridge was just cited by the SEC for a breach of fiduciary ability, duty. They were putting their own financial ahead, interest ahead of the clients. They were doing something to take money that should have been going to clients that instead padded the profits of Cambridge Investment Research. What they were doing is they were putting clients, they were doing a couple things. One thing they were doing is they were putting clients into new mutual funds where there was a revenue sharing basis on the mutual funds. So when mutual funds go on a platform, whether it be Fidelity, whether it be Schwab, whether it be on the platform with, with Cambridge, when they do that, some mutual funds do what's revenue sharing. You know, you have different classes of, of mutual funds. But there's a kickback that goes to the firms or to the financial advisors. It's a kickback, which is usually not disclosed. <coughs> it's a hidden fee. And for Cambridge Investment, it was a hidden fee that Cambridge kept or their advisors kept. And they never disclosed the fact that they were doing that to their clients. <coughs> Got a little cough. Sorry about that. And the other thing they were doing is they were converting accounts to fee basis, to a wrap fee account, whether or not they should have been or not. Now, when you do this, they were doing exactly the same thing in the wrap account, the fee based accounts, as they were doing in the transaction accounts. But by doing it in a fee-based account, even when the markets go down, you continue to collect a fee. In a transaction type account, you have to make every single transaction. You have to talk to the client every time. With a fee-based account, they were doing exactly the same thing, but they were charging a fee for it. And they did that whether it made sense for the client or not. When you're charging 1% for a wrap-based fee, versus a transaction base, which the percent, if you add up all the commissions, might be less than 1%. It's in the client's best interest to do the transaction account, not the fee-based account. Now, this is very different from what we do at Adams Financial Concepts, where we're doing an advice, an advisory thing, where we're actually, with discretion, managing client accounts and we are doing it in such a way that client, we have a, a passion for creating wealth and maintaining wealth for our clients. And we've been doing that for 17 years 
and we've been doing very well by our clients. It's very different from what Cambridge was doing where they were doing exactly the same in commission accounts as they were doing in fee-based accounts. And they were not examining to see whether it was in the client's best interest. And in fact, Cambridge had set up contest and rewards and they were giving forgivable loans to the financial advisors if the financial advisors met certain criteria. Not unlike Wells Fargo a few years ago. If you, if you did this, if you were moving people into fee-based accounts from transaction accounts, if you were actually moving them to certain mutual funds, you got a forgivable loan. Why a forgivable loan? because it meant you had to be there for a certain amount of time before you could collect, whether it was three years or five years, and you had to maintain those assets in those fee-based accounts. So if somebody moved from a transaction account to a fee-based account and realized they were getting screwed in the whole thing and moved their account to somewhere else, that forgivable loan became a straight loan and not a forgivable loan. So. That was the, the whole point of what Cambridge was doing, and they did it from 2014, when times were really getting tight, when income was, when costs were rising faster than revenues. That's when Cambridge started that. They got it. I have to share, along that line, I experienced some of that as well. Things that were done not in the best interest of the client. It was a specific, in my case, I started, I licensed with Payne Weber back in 1986. In 1990, I moved to Dane Bosworth, which became Dane Rauscher, which is RBC today. And when I did that, I continued to do my own research. I was managing accounts, but I met Wayne Josephson in Houston at a Dane event and he talked me into doing Boston Chicken. I normally would have read the offering statement, but he took me through a complete financial analysis and he showed me essentially that I was able to buy for my clients a bond that was rated junk, but I could buy a bond that financially looked like it was investment grade. Now the story behind this whole thing is that, and I'm pulling out my notes, <laughs> Josephson had 19 years experience before coming to Dane and had a big background. Um, Dane itself would actually end up not supervising it. And Dane realized they had a problem with junk bonds. In general, because Dane had about a billion dollars in junk bonds and no research. So they hired Josephson. And in the early 1990s, uh, there'd been an analyst, Derek Hills, but he had left, he had left Dane. So they hired Josephson to replace him. And whether he was the right hire or not is really a question. And they, is, they assigned him some 40 different bonds to analyze. But in doing so, they failed to supervise what he was doing. He talked to a trader. He talked to a senior corporate bond trader. But very seldom did he talk to his, his boss, who was the director of retail fixed income. Nor did he talk to the director of the fixed income group and a member of the executive committee. That person never once talked to Joseph Susan. There was no supervision. He was left to do what he wanted to do. And it wasn't an isolated incident. The, ent the entire money department was audited in 1997 by the SEC and NASD, and they found that there was a lack of supervision throughout the entire department. Almost all the paperwork from the branch prior to 97 was so disorganized that the that all the financial advisors, all the ed brokers had to resubmit all the paperwork for everyone that had been enrolled prior to 1997. That was the mess that Josephson came into. There was no supervision. He was left on his own. And maybe he was overwhelmed by the, the time. 
He would, however, end up being fired by Dane three months after a couple bonds blew up. Boston Chicken was, in fact, the third bond default that would happen at Dane. We're coming up to a commercial break. I'll tell you the rest of the story. I'll tell you what's going on. All of this in detail, pointing out the fact that in, in the brokerage houses, you are not really aware of what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know who's supervising whom. You don't know that people are even getting any supervision of what's going on. All of that is happening. You don't know if you have an account at a major brokerage firm or even at one of the regional firms who's supervising your, your, your financial advisor, who's supervising the people that are recommending things to them. Come back and we'll finish a lot of this story. So I'm talking about Boston Chicken and what went on at Dane when I was at Dane. Very significant because this is insight into what goes on at the big brokerage houses into the regional brokerage houses. Dane had hired Wayne Josephson because Dane had a billion dollars in junk bonds that their financial advisors, that their brokers have, had sold to clients and there was no supervision on those bonds. So they hired Josephson, who had 19 years of experience, supposedly, to come in and analyze. There were 40 issues of that $1 billion. And Josephson made an analysis. He made an analysis of Boston chicken bonds. And when I was in Houston, normally I would have done, read the offering statements on any bond that I bought for clients done at least a preliminary skim of something to know what was going on. But in this case, Josephson had all the figures. He had it all laid out. He talked to me about doing it. Uh, and we went one-on-one. -on -one. He went through all the financials of Boston Chicken. They had some $500 million in debt. What he happened to leave out was a master lease agreement where Boston Chicken was loaning money to their franchisees. They had loaned some $280 million at the time that he did the analysis, essentially 30% of their debt. And he, when he presented it, all the calculations were based on a debt and a debt service that was absent the master lease agreement. 671 was what he reported. In fact, they had $950 million in debt when you had the master lease agreement in for what they were they had borrowed to finance the franchisees. The cash available, when you looked at it, the earnings before interest and taxes and depreciation and amortization, EBITDA, when Josephson calculated it, it was $110 million. And dividing that by the $700 million, it gave a coverage ratio of 3.7, 3.7, more than enough cash to cover the amount of interest they were paying by almost fourfold. And that's, that's a key number in analyzing bonds. A bond that has over tenfold coverage gets a triple A rating. Seven to 10 gets a double A rating. Four to seven gets A rating. Three to four, it's a triple B rating. If you have coverage of over three, you have what's considered an investment grade bond. Now, if it's under three, if it's two to three, it's double B junk bond. One to two, it's a B junk bond. Under one, it's triple C close to default. If it's zero, of course, it's a D and you're on the verge of, of default. But, you know, Josephson analyzed it by leaving out that master lease agreement. It looked as though the coverage was exceptional. You were able to buy a junk bond, rated junk bond, at an investment, or actually, I've got it reversed. You're able to buy essentially an investment grade bond at a junk bond price. I mean, doing that is like a slam dunk and the fact is, that happens not infrequently that those situations occur. Take bonds for a place like Paul's Bowen, municipal bond, 
they seldom get their bonds rated because of the cost of rating the bonds is very significant. So if you have a smaller bond issue, you don't get it rated. But in the case of Paul's bow, this goes back to the 1990s. They had more than a 10 to 1 coverage ratio. They would have been rated, had they gone through the process, they would have been rated AAA. But you get it as a non-rated bond, or sometimes you have bonds that are that are initially issued at junk bond and income increases, they get coverage, more than enough coverage to become investment grade. And that was the situation with Boston Chicken. 3.7, that made it a triple B bond in reality, had that been true. But with Boston Chicken, it wasn't true. In Boston Chicken, it was less than three, significantly less than three. And Josephson had no supervision, none. He hadn't talked to the head of fixed income. He hadn't talked, not even once during his time there, to the head of the fixed income group. Not once had he ever seen that person. And Dane had a significant amount of junk bonds in their system, over a billion dollars. Um, when Dane reported out their, their fourth quarter of 1998, they took a write down of different, different areas, but they didn't take any write down on their junk bonds. Had they taken and done a complete real analysis, it would have wiped out their earnings for a couple years, but they didn't do that. Now there's 900 brokers at over 900 brokers at Dane that had Boston chicken bonds. I came back after the meeting with Josephson and put 22 of my clients into Boston chicken bonds. It wasn't until Boston chicken filed for bankruptcy that I read the offering statement. And when I read the offering statement, I went to Dane management and said, Dane should step up and should make a payment from Dane, take, the, take part of the loss or all of the loss, and they should take the hit. But by this time, by the time all of this was beginning to roll out, already three of the bonds that Josephson had analyzed had already filed for bankruptcy. APS bonds had filed for bankruptcy. And I don't remember the second bond that had filed, for, the second that filed for bankruptcy, but Boston Chicken had also filed for bankruptcy. And it was almost as if management was shell-shocked. They stood back and said, we were blindsided. We didn't know. We, Josephson did his correct work. He was correct in what he did. He was not correct in what he did. He was dead wrong in what he did. And rather than saying, that they should have supervised, they should have taken care of it. Instead of that, they said we were blindsided. They said that once, twice, three times. And after saying that three times, I talked to my clients. I talked to an attorney. I had my clients meet. Most of the clients met with that attorney on a Thursday evening. On Friday, I resigned. And on Monday, my clients filed suit against Dane. My clients collected 75 cents on the dollar. We went through a mediation and through that mediation, eventually Dane came around and paid my clients 75 cents on the dollar. But in doing so, my clients were the only ones at Dane that collected anything. Everyone out of the other clients, all of them took the entire 100% of the loss and got nothing from Dane, nothing, zero, zip. And Bain, when I had talked about doing this, and I talked to a number of, of brokers, a number of financial advisors, brokers in those days, I talked to a number of my, my colleagues and said, we should do this as a group. They, didn't, they weren't sure that they wanted to do it as a group. They wanted to see how it would roll out. And sure enough, when I, when my clients filed, Dane came out and wanted to make an example of me. They gave significant incentives 
to the brokers to keep my clients at Dane and not to move with me to Everin, which is where I moved. They told all sorts of lies and the brokers told all sorts of lies. Dane sued me. They let all the brokers at Dane know that they were suing me. Dane made it very pointed that they, the brokers knew that Dane was suing me. They expected to, that my legal costs were going to be very, very large and they were going to try to get me thrown out of the industry. They went to the New York Stock Exchange and said I had 22 complaints. We responded legally and said, wait a minute, these are complaints not against Mike Adams. These are against Dane Rauscher, against RBC today. You know, the fact is we went through an arbitration. We didn't quite make it to arbitration. Before we got there, we went through mediation. I settled for 45K, which was less than my legal fees. But I won. My clients won. But over half stayed at Dane because of what the Dane brokers told them that Dane had stepped up and paid them off. Dane had done it. It wasn't because of what I did. It was because of what Dane did. That's just was a bold lie. It wasn't what Dane did. It's what I did. And because my clients were the only ones, if all the clients had received that, that's one thing. But my clients were the only ones to do that. That, that is what happens at the big brokerage firms. I survived it. My clients survived it. But my clients were the only ones to collect. I recognize what went on at Cambridge. I recognize that the firm makes the decisions in their best interest, not in the client's best interest. If the client's best interest lines up with the firm's best interest, then certainly the firm is ready to say that they have the client's best interest. But if there's a, if there's a difference, the firms will make the decision on their best interest, not in the client's best interest. We're coming again to a commercial break. Don't go away. I want to talk about the whole, whole thing because this happens not just in the financial industry. It happens in a lot of industries. And I want to touch on it. I also want to come back and talk about what's going on in the markets with the Russia, Ukraine war and post-war. So don't go away. We've got a lot to cover. And if you missed part of this program, you can find it on YouTube. You can find the podcast on our website. Do look at it and check it out. And stay with me because I want to finish this up. Don't go. I've been talking about Cambridge. I've been talking about Dane, Dane Bosworth, Dane Rauscher, RBC, and my experience with Boston Chicken. But you know, the internet, as powerful as it is, it is has never revealed all the things that are going on. At the time I was going through the Boston chicken thing at the end of the 90s, that was, that was a period of time in which the internet was really coming alive. And I think about that and think about what was happening in the early 2000s. <coughs> Pardon me, I have to take a sip of water. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that happened was Enron. They had hidden partnerships. They disguised their debt and they manipulated the energy markets. When you think about that time and the dot coms, you had Henry Blodgett of Merrill Lynch and Jack Grubman of Solomon Smith Barney. They wrote glowing research reports of dot com companies which they knew, they knew were junk. They, they created the phrase, put lipstick on the pig and sell it to the unwary individual investors. Think about that time Sam Waxel, Waxel dumped his income stock when he got an early, early word of damaging information from the FDA. And Martha Stewart, who is pretty famous, dumped her own shares and then she lied about it. WorldCom and Global Crossing, they fabricated billions of dollars in revenues to pump up their stock price. They didn't have the revenues, but they just created a, their revenues for their books out of thin air. There was 
a group of mutual fund companies that let preferred customers trade at preferred prices, and another group that was charged with hiding management fees, not unlike Cambridge that I mentioned at the beginning. That has gone on for decades and is probably still going on. And all those crimes had one common thing in common. There were sins of information. Most of these crimes involved an expert. In the case of Boston Chicken, it was Wayne Josephson who failed to receive any supervision. They had an expert. These things had an expert or a gang of experts. They were promoting false information or hiding the truth. And in every case, they were trying to keep the information as asymmetrical as possible, as hidden as possible. And the people who were committing these acts, who were taking advantage of investors, the people who were committing these acts inevitably offered the same defense. They offered the same defense and you hear it in my industry time and time again. Well, everybody was doing it. It's what everyone does. You know, we're not any different from anyone else. Everyone else is doing it too. Which, when you look at the track record, it's probably true that most of the firms are doing it. The only thing that is different is some get caught. You know, it's not unlike street crimes. They don't, street crimes, you have a corpse or a broken window, you know. But in these crimes, the, the damage is not obvious. You know, they don't, it's not apparent until somebody really digs into the books and understands. It's not apparent when Dane claimed we were blindsided. It's not apparent to not to any investor of those other brokers that the analyst, Wayne Josephson, had left out the master lease agreement in which Boston Chicken borrowed money and loaned it to the franchisees and when Boston Chicken filed for bankruptcy, they still owed that money. But it wasn't apparent that Dane had hired an analyst who left that out of his analysis, and that analyst had no supervision. He seldom talked to the person who was head of the department and never talked to his boss's boss, not once during the entire time he was there. You know? because everybody was doing it. That's the excuse. You know, one of the things that I thought was interesting is a tape from Enron traders. They were talking about how California officials wanted to make Enron refund, refund profits of price gouging. Because remember, what Enron did is they created an artificial scenario where prices skyrocketed because they were negotiating contracts based on a lack of supply or what people thought they were. So this is, I'm going to read you the, this is between Kevin and Bob. Kevin says, they're effing taking all the money back from you guys. All the money you guys stole from those poor grandmas in California. And Bob says, yeah, Grandma Millie, man. Kevin says, yeah. Now she wants her effing money back for all the power you jammed right up her rear end for a an effing $250 a megawatt hour. If you were to assume that many experts use their information to your detriment, you'd be right. Experts depend upon the fact you don't have the information they do. Or that you're so befuddled by the complexity of their operation, you wouldn't know what to do if you had the information or that you're so in awe of their expertise you wouldn't dare challenge them. If your doctor suggests you have angioplasty, even though some current research suggests that angioplasty does not little to prevent heart attacks, you aren't likely to think about what the doctor is saying to you. 
that was an actual conversation between two people at Enron because they were charging super high prices to consumers and they were being pushed to give the money back. Took that from a book called Freakonomics. If you ever have a chance to read Freakonomics, I recommend it. It's, it's well worth the reading, by the way. So Cambridge, Cambridge, your excuses, everybody else is doing it. Does that make you feel really good to know that everyone else is doing it so it's okay to take advantage of you? It's okay to essentially steal your money? And that's what they're doing. It's the client's money. It's the client. It should have been going to the clients. If somebody came in and you had a bank account, you have $16,000 in your bank account, and they take 8000 of it, you know? That's a crime. That's a crime. And that's called stealing. In the case of Cambridge, Cambridge just didn't give you what they should have been giving. And they didn't disclose it. They didn't say, we have revenue sharing and we're going to keep all the revenue share. No, they didn't disclose that either. They just did it because, as they said, everyone else is doing it. You know, at AFC, we set up to be completely transparent. You get to see all the fees. Yes, we're high. We're high because we say we're high because we're very good. And the fact is we publish our results and you can see our composite. And you can see if you look at the composite right now, we're not doing so well. I believe by the end of the year that will write itself and we will be on track to do very well. But we're completely transparent. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to, to, to blow smoke and say, you know, we're doing really well when we're not doing so well right now. We think that we will be doing well by the end of the year. And our clients know exactly what they're being charged. They know exactly where their accounts are. And our clients can look at their accounts 24 hours a day and know that's where they are. They can compare the stocks, prices in their portfolios with what the market say, what's published numbers. They can look at all the fees that are charged because they're all right there. And if they really want to do it, they can sit down, they can add up the price of their stocks, they can look at the value at the end of the year, and they can see exactly where all the fees and, and costs were charged. It's simple. It's straightforward. It's transparent. We're not trying to hide anything. Because everyone else may be doing it doesn't mean that we have the right to do it. That's... That's going on in this industry. And you should be aware that hidden fees and overcharges and fees that really belong to you are being stolen from your accounts. And I use that word stolen because I can't think of a better way to describe it. You have money. If, you have a, if you're with one of the big brokerage firms, you have money that probably belongs to you that's going to the firm instead of you. Why? Why? Because everybody else is doing it. Why shouldn't we? Isn't that the excuse they use? Everyone else is doing it. It's amazing to me. It's not ethical. In fact, it's not legal. But everyone's doing it, so why not do it? And we're under pressure, they say. Our revenues are growing, our assets are growing, but our costs are growing faster than our, our revenues. So. We need to recoup from our clients. We need to steal from our clients. Never gets to that point because that would be, and the F SEC and the FINRA are not going to say they steal. But the reality, you know, and I know. Don't go away because this brings me to talking about what's going on with Russia and the Ukraine. What's happening in the markets? That's coming up right after this commercial break. You want to hear what I have to say about that. Don't go away. Okay. I want to talk about the markets right now. I want to talk about what's going on. What's, it's going to be with us for a while because we are in an inflationary period of time. And it, there's two types of inflation. One is the supply push inflation. One is the demand pull. Supply push is where you have 
supplies which are limited and a demand for those supplies which is continuing to grow. And so people are willing to pay more and more and more. So use cars because people are ready to trade their cars in or ready to change or their car has to be, they have to buy a car. There's not the new car available, so they buy the used car. And used car prices, some used car prices got to be higher than new car prices. That's a supply push inflation. And as we go through the, as the war and that invasion happened, it changed the world perspective. Oil, of course, was very visible. Gasoline prices were very visible. Oil shot to $130 a barrel almost immediately when, when the invasion began and then began to come down. Oil, people were concerned because 50% of the Russian government revenues, federal tax were 50% and oil revenues were 50%. And so Russia depended upon oil. And so there was a concern that as, as people cut back on purchasing Russian oil, that that would take oil out of the market and that would cause prices to increase. And in fact, they did increase. Prices shot up. And I remember the 70s when people talked about inflation as being a rocket and feather. Prices go up like a rocket, and they come down slowly like a feather. That is the concern. That was the concern with oil. And oil was really visible, visible at the gas pumps. It's visible by the news. But what isn't so, so visible are some of the other areas where Russia supplied, where export, Russia exported products into the world. Half of the United States, half of the uranium that's consumed in the United States came from Russia. Half of the uranium, half of what powered nuclear power plants in America comes from, came from Russia. That is also true of plants that were in France, plants that were in, in Germany, plants that were around the world. Those nuclear plants were getting uranium from Russia. As the war grinds on, that is a major thing. One-tenth of the world's supply of aluminum and copper shipped out and exported from Russia. One-fifth of the battery-grade nickel exported from Russia. Palladium, a key automotive and electronics component. I can't tell you how much, but it's greater than one-fifth of the world supply. All of that came out of Russia. And what happens in the beginning is you have a pipeline that's full. You have all those materials on ships or in trucks. It's been, it's been mined. It's been loaded on trucks. It's been loaded into ships, into containers. Those containers are at sea. They're being transported. They arrive wherever. They're taken there, and then they're moved to wherever they're consumed. And so for a period of, of three or four or five weeks, it's the pipeline which is supplying all those materials. But what isn't happening after when that invasion began and when the those supplies were cut off, and they weren't cut off immediately. They weren't cut off like oil immediately. What happens is that those materials begin to slow down and the supply begins to go away. The pipeline, full, actually over full at the time of the invasion, gets depleted and suddenly you have a shortage of supply of those materials. Suddenly you have a shortage of supply of batteries for electric vehicles. You have a shortage of aluminum and copper for construction. You have a shortage of uranium. Now those supplies continued to ship out and some of the pipeline continued to be filled or not filled, but 
some of the supply continued to roll on, but it had an impact. And Russia was the biggest exporter of the ingredients to make fertilizer as well. And all of this, this war began at a, in the springtime when fertilizer is needed and manufacturing a fertilizer is important to do. All of that happened. And if you look at the Ukraine and Russia, the Ukraine was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. The Ukraine supplied a lot of the foodstuffs. 20% of the traded wheat came mostly from Ukraine, some from Russia. 12% of the world's calories, 12% of the world's calories from the Ukraine and Russia. And think of that being cut off because of the invasion. Now, wheat, wheat is one of those products that will be raised and not, not shipped until fall, or some of it will, be, will wait until fall. But 12% of the world's calories are coming from the Ukraine and some from Russia. Barley and corn and sunflowers, all of that shipped from the Ukraine. All of that is going to have a significant impact. That is an analysis that needs to be made on portfolios. That is an understanding that needs to be built into. I talked about index funds from time to time because index funds, the idea is a broad range of things so that you get this coverage and you don't have to take the risk. And there's a lot of a lot of diversification. The problem is there are going to be stocks that do very poorly because products coming out of Russia or coming some from the Ukraine are going to be cut off. It's important. We analyze all the stocks in our client portfolios to be sure that the impact is going to be minimal or nothing in our stock portfolios. We want to be sure that we go beyond this period of time. But individual clients, people that are not with us, should be doing the same thing, looking at their portfolios and understanding the impact of what the war will be and what the aftermath of the war will be. Because it's a lot easier to stop supply than to restart it. It's one of those things. Our world is constantly changing. Things that have never happened before happen all the time. An analysis of what's happening makes absolute necessity in analyzing a portfolio, understanding where things are invested, why they're invested, and what the probability of success really is. That wraps it up. I hope that it's been a good, good session for you. I will be back next Saturday. We'll be back to talk about money. And have a great rest of the weekend and a great week. And just because everybody does it doesn't mean everyone does it. Just because the excuse is used, everyone else is doing it, doesn't mean that everyone else is doing it. We don't. Anyway, have a very wonderful week. And we'll be back to talk about Monday. If it's Saturday at noon, we're talking about money.